Welcome to a fireside reading of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, Chapter 52, Part 3. Much affected, but still intensely enjoying himself, Mr. Micawber folded up his letter and handed it with a bow to my aunt as something she might like to keep. There was, as I had noticed on my first visit long ago, an iron safe in the room. The key was in it. A hasty suspicion seemed to strike Uriah, and with a glance at Mr. Micawber, he went to it and threw the doors clanking open. It was empty. Where are the books? he cried with a frightful face. Some thief has stolen the books. Mr. Micawber tapped himself with the ruler. I did, when I got the key from you as usual, but a little earlier, and opened it this morning. Don't be uneasy, said Traddles. They have come into my possession. I will take care of them under the authority I mentioned. You receive stolen goods, do you? cried Uriah. Under such circumstances, answered Traddles, yes. What was my astonishment when I beheld my aunt, who had been profoundly quiet and attentive, make a dart at Uriah Heap and seize him by the collar with both hands? You know what I want, said my aunt. A straight waistcoat, said he. No, my property, returned my aunt. Agnes, my dear, as long as I believed it had been really made away with by your father, I wouldn't, and my dear, I didn't even to trot, as he knows, breathe a syllable of its having been placed here for investment. But now I know this fellow's answerable for it, and I'll have it. Trot, come and take it away from him. Whether my aunt supposed for the moment that he kept her property in his neckerchief, I am sure I don't know, but she certainly pulled at it as if she thought so. I hastened to put myself between them, and to assure her that we would all take care that he should make the utmost restitution of everything he had wrongly got. This, and a few moments' reflection, pacified her, but she was not at all disconcerted by what she had done, though I cannot say as much for her bonnet, and resumed her seat composedly. During the last few minutes, Mrs. Heap had been clamouring to her son to be umbo, and had been going down on her knees to all of us in succession and making the wildest promises. Her son sat her down in his chair and standing sulkily by her, holding her arm with his hand, but not rudely, said to me with a ferocious look, What do you want done? I will tell you what must be done said Traddles. Has that Copperfield no tongue? muttered Uriah. I would do a good deal for you if you could tell me without lying that somebody had cut it out. My Uriah means to be humble, cried his mother. Don't mind what he says, good gentleman. What must be done, said Traddles, is this. First, the deed of relinquishment that we have heard of must be given over to me now, here. Suppose I haven't got it, he interrupted. But you have, said Traddles. Therefore, you know, we won't suppose so. And I cannot help avowing that this was the first occasion on which I really did justice to the clear head and the plain, patient, practical, good sense 
of my old schoolfellow. Then, Traddle said, you must prepare to disgorge all that your rapacity has become possessed of and to make restoration to the last farthing. All the partnership books and papers must remain in our possession and all your books and papers, all money accounts and securities of both kinds. In short, everything here. Must it? I don't know that, said Uriah. I must have time to think about that. Certainly, replied Traddles. But in the meanwhile, and until everything is done to our satisfaction, we shall maintain possession of these things and beg you, in short, compel you to keep to your own womb and hold no communication with anyone. I won't do it, said Uriah with an oath. Maidstone Jail is a safer place of detention, observed Traddles, and though the law may be longer in writing us and may not be able to write us so completely as you can, there is no doubt of its punishing you. Dear me, you know that quite as well as I. Copperfield, will you go round to the Guildhall and bring a couple of officers? Here Mrs. Heap broke out again, crying on her knees to Agnes to interfere in their behalf, exclaiming that he was very humble and it was all true, and if he didn't do what we wanted, she would, and much more to the same purpose, being half frantic with tears for her darling. To inquire what he might have done if he had had any boldness would be like inquiring what a mongrel cur might do if it had the spirit of a tiger. He was a coward from head to foot and showed his dastardly nature through his sullenness and mortification as much as at any time of his mean life. Stop! He growled to me and wiped his hot face with his hand. Mother, hold your noise! Well, let him have that deed. Go and fetch it. Do you help her, Mr. Dick, said Traddles, if you please. Proud of his commission and understanding it, Mr. Dick accompanied her as a shepherd's dog might accompany a sheep. But Mrs. Heap gave him little trouble, for she not only returned with the deed, but with the box in which it was, where we found a banker's book and some other papers that were afterwards serviceable. Good, said Traddles when this was brought. Now, Mr. Heap, you can retire to think, a particularly observing, if you please, that I declare to you on the part of all present that there is only one thing to be done, that it is what I have explained and that it must be done without delay. Uriah, without lifting his eyes from the ground, shuffled across the room with his hand to his chin and pausing at the door said, Copperfield, I have always hated you. You've always been an upstart and you've always been against me. As I think I told you once before, said I, it is you who have been, in your greed and cunning, against all the world. It may be profitable to you to reflect in future, but there never were greed and cunning in the world yet that did not do too much and overreach themselves. It is as certain as death or as certain as they used to teach at school, the same school where I picked up so much humbleness from nine o'clock to eleven, that labour was a curse, and from eleven o'clock to one that it was a blessing and a cheerfulness and a dignity and I don't know what all, eh? said he with a sneer. You preach about as consistent as they do. Won't humbleness go down? I shouldn't have got round my gentleman fellow partner without it, I think. Micawber, 
you old bully. I'll pay you. Mr. Micawber, supremely defiant of him and his extended finger, and making a great deal of his chest until he had slunk out of the door, then addressed himself to me and proffered me the satisfaction of witnessing the re-establishment of mutual confidence between himself and Mrs. Micawber after which he invited the company generally to the contemplation of that affecting spectacle, the veil that has long been interposed between Mrs. Micawber and myself is now withdrawn, said Mr. Micawber, and my children and the author of their being can once more come in contact on equal terms. As we were all very grateful to him, and all desirous to show that we were, as well as the hurry and disorder of our spirits would permit, I dare say we should all have gone, but that it was necessary for Agnes to return to her father, as yet unable to bear more than the dawn of hope, and for someone else to hold Uriah in safe keeping. So, Traddles remained for the latter purpose to be presently relieved by Mr. Dick, and Mr. Dick, my aunt, and I went home with Mr. Micawber. As I parted hurriedly from the dear girl to whom I owed so much, and thought from what she had been saved, perhaps, that morning, her better resolution notwithstanding, I felt devoutly thankful for the miseries of my younger days, which had brought me to the knowledge of Mr. Micawber. His house was not far off, and as the street door opened into the sitting room and he bolted in with a precipitation quite his own, we found ourselves at once in the bosom of the family, Mr. Micawber exclaiming, Emma, my life! rushed into Mrs. Micawber's arms. Mrs. Micawber shrieked and folded Mr. Micawber in her embrace. Miss Micawber, nursing the unconscious stranger of Mrs. Micawber's last letter to me, was sensibly affected. The stranger leaped. The twins testified their joy by several inconvenient but innocent demonstrations. Master Micawber, whose disposition appeared to have been soured by early disappointment, and whose aspect had become morose, yielded to his better feelings and blubbered. Emma, said Mr. Micawber, the cloud is passed from my mind. Mutual confidence so long preserved between us is restored to know no further interruption. Now welcome poverty, cried Mr. Micawber, shedding tears. Welcome misery. Welcome houselessness, welcome hunger, rags, tempest, and beggary. Mutual confidence will sustain us to the end. With these expressions, Mr. Micawber placed Mrs. Micawber in a chair and embraced the family all round, welcoming a variety of bleak prospects, which appeared, to the best of my judgment, to be anything but welcome to them and calling upon them to come out into Canterbury and sing a chorus as nothing else was left for their support. But Mrs. Micawber, having in the strength of her emotions fainted away, the first thing to be done, even before the chorus could be considered complete, was to recover her. This my aunt and Mr. Micawber did, and then my aunt was introduced to Mrs. Micawber and she recognized me. Excuse me, dear Mr. Copperfield, said the poor lady, giving me her hand, but I am not strong, and the removal of the late misunderstanding between Mr. Micawber and myself was at first too much for me. Is this all your family, ma'am? said my aunt. There are no more at present returned Mrs. Micawber. Good gracious, 
I didn't mean that, ma'am, said my aunt. I mean, are all these yours? Madam, replied Mr. Micawber, it is a true bill. And that eldest young gentleman now, said my aunt, musing, what has he been brought up to? It was my hope when I came here, said Mr. Micawber, to have got Wilkins into the church. Or perhaps I shall express my meaning more strictly if I say the choir, but there was no vacancy for a tenor in the venerable pile for which this city is so justly eminent. And he has, in short, he has contracted a habit of singing in public houses rather than in sacred edifices. But he means well, said Mrs. Micawber tenderly. I dare say, my love, rejoined Mr. Micawber, that he means particularly well, but I have not yet found that he carries out his meaning in any given direction whatsoever. Master Micawber's moroseness of aspect returned upon him again, and he demanded with some temper what he was to do, whether he had been born a carpenter or a coach painter any more than he had been born a bird, whether he could go into the next street and open a chemist's shop, whether he could rush to the next assizes and proclaim himself a lawyer, whether he could come out by force at the opera and succeed by violence, whether he could do anything without being brought up to something. My aunt mused a little while and then said, Mr. Micawber, I wonder you have never turned your thoughts to emigration. Madam, returned Mr. Micawber, it was the dream of my youth and the fallacious aspiration of my riper years. I am thoroughly persuaded, by the by, that he had never thought of it in his life. I, said my aunt with a glance at me, why, what a thing it would be for yourselves and your family, Mr. and Mrs. Micawber, if you were to emigrate now. Capital, madam, capital, urged Mr. Micawber gloomily. That is the principle, I may say the only difficulty, uh, my dear Mr. Copperfield, assented his wife. Capital, cried my aunt, but you are doing us a great service, have done us a great service, I may say, for surely much will come out of the fire. And what could we do for you that would be half so good as to find the capital? I could not receive it as a gift, said Mr. Micawber, full of fire and animation. But if a sufficient sum could be advanced, say at 5% per annum, interest upon my personal liability, say my notes of hand at 12, 18, and 24 months respectively, to allow time for something to turn up, could be, can be, and shall be on your own terms, returned my aunt. If you say the word, think of this now, both of you, here are some people David knows going out to Australia shortly. If you decide to go, why shouldn't you go in the same ship? You may help each other. Think of this now, Mr. and Mrs. Micawber. Take your time and weigh it well. There is but... One question, my dear ma'am, I could wish to ask, said Mrs. Micawber. The climate, I believe, is healthy. Finest in the world, said my aunt. Just so, returned Mrs. Micawber. Then my question arises. Now, are the circumstances of the country such that a man of 
Mr. Micawber's abilities would have a fair chance of rising in the social scale. I will not say at present might he aspire to be governor or anything of that sort, but would there be a reasonable opening for his talents to develop themselves? That would be amply sufficient and find their own expansion. No better opening anywhere, said my aunt for a man who conducts himself well and is industrious. For a man who conducts himself well, repeated Mrs. Micawber with her clearest business manner, and is industrious, precisely. It is evident to me that Australia is the legitimate sphere of action for Mr. Micawber. I entertain the conviction, my dear madam, said Mr. Micawber, that it is under existing circumstances the land, the only land for myself and family, and that something of an extraordinary nature will turn up on that shore. It is no distance, comparatively speaking, and though consideration is due to the kindness of your proposal, I assure you that is a mere matter of form. Shall I ever forget how, in a moment, he was the most sanguine of men looking on to fortune, or how Mrs. Micawber presently discoursed about the habits of the kangaroo? Shall I ever recall that street of Canterbury on a market day without recalling him as he walked back with us, expressing in the hardy, roving manner he assumed the unsettled habits of a temporary sojourner in the land and looking at the bullocks as they came by with the eye of an Australian farmer. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for your help with The Wizard of Oz. I look forward to seeing you very much, not tomorrow, but the day after. We have a day off tomorrow, but back on Saturday. And until I see you then, please, everyone, stay very, very well. Good night.